I want to start this morning with a question, and it's kind of an odd question. I understand it's an odd question, so just bear with me, humor me a little bit. And the question is this, how many of you, show of hands, how many of you at some point this morning looked in the mirror? Humor me, people. Okay. What's odd is not everybody raised their hand, right? That's a little weird to me. Okay, you look around, like, how many use a mirror? And there's people like, oh, I don't know. You can identify an ex-hippie by that question right there. Like, did you look in a mirror? No, oh, what's that? Like, I don't know. Um, and some of you, you raise your hand. Others of you, you look at me and you're like, wait, 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 wait. Like, you got this weird, like, weak attempt at a beard going on. Did you look at a mirror because you look stupid? Like, what about you, bro? And I, I have no explanation for that at all. Um, I went fishing last weekend, and when you fish, you grow, a, like, a beard or you put your best attempt forward as a man because it helps you catch fish. So I did that. And it, it helps, okay? Try it sometime. Um, and, and so I did that, and then I was going to shave for service this morning. My wife's like, no, 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 I think it's cute. You should keep it. And I'm like, you're messing with me. Like, is this a test? Like, what are you doing to me right now? And like during service, I think she just laughs. Like, you look dumb in front of a bunch of people, but that's cool. <laughs> it worked. You know, like that's how it feels. Okay, back to the question. Let me rephrase the question. Take it one step further. How many of you look in a mirror multiple times in a day? Okay, a lot less hands, right? All of a sudden, you can really begin to separate a room by that question. Like, everybody's like, okay, I'll check it out once. I look in the mirror. How many multiple times a day the room starts to to separate a little bit? And we see less hands raised. And and, uh, the reality is, most of you didn't raise your hand. You're lying. That's okay. I'm cool with it. If you're cool with it, it's fine. Um, Because we know that you look in a mirror multiple times in a day, but you don't want people to know because you want to think you're naturally beautiful. That's cool, you know? Or or guys, you're like, I don't use a mirror. I'm a man, you know? And it's like, no, I saw you before service in the bathroom checking yourself out, so you use a mirror. Regardless of either of those, how you answer, let me take this one step further. Can we all agree that mirrors are helpful? We can all agree with that? Fair? Okay. Mirrors are helpful. Like, they they allow you, especially if you're in the business world or you want to look like a civilized human being, they allow you to look that way, right? You can stand in front of the mirror, kind of do your thing. They're They're a helpful kind of tool for us. In this series that we've been in, Without Love, that we've been in for the past several weeks, We've been in the book of 1 Corinthians, and we've been specifically in in chapter 13, and it's this letter, 1 Corinthians is, is this letter that Paul, this author, has written to this group of people, and what he's doing, this letter is written in a way that, that Paul is hoping that it kind of plays the role of a mirror for this group of people, the Corinthians. You see, oftentimes we look at, many of us, we look at first Christian or not, been in the church or not, we look at 1 Corinthians 13 and we see it and we think it's like this beautiful, poetic, like, oh my word, it's absolutely amazing, 1 Corinthians 13. And and in some way, very true, it is that. But what we don't realize is 1 Corinthians 13 is actually written in in the form of a little bit of a rebuke that, that Paul is putting out towards these people, the Corinthians. And it's a letter that Paul's writing to this group of Christian people, probably not much different than you and I, and, and they're not loving each other well. And so Paul writes, writes this letter to them, and this specific section in, in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul's basically turning the mirror around on the Corinthians, and he's saying, hey, you think you love well? You think you know how to love others well? Let me show you a little something. Why don't you take a little bit closer of a look? And I think if you and I are completely honest, what we've been in this, what we've been looking at in this series, 1 Corinthians 13, it's not really that easy to live out, is it? Like we read these things and it's like, man, that's not easy. I, I, I want to read 1 Corinthians 13. I want to read verses 4 through 6. It's kind of where we've been camping the last few weeks. And, and it says this, starting in verse 4, it says, Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist in its own way. And for the past two weeks, Grant has, has been unpacking those couple of verses, what, what love should or should not be based on what Paul says right there. And we're going to pick up at the second half of, half of verse 5 today. And it says, It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing but rejoices with the truth. And and as you look at that, I'm going to read it one more time. It says, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It's not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Does anybody else look at that and go, this is unrealistic? Like, I I look at that, and and I just think, man, 
love is, love is patient and kind. Love is not arrogant or rude. It's not resentful. It's not, it, it, it does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. And this isn't even the end of the letter. And I look at that and I go, I can't love that way. Like, that's unrealistic, Paul. Like, what are you, what are you doing here? And some of you will call you the overachievers in your room. You're like, hey, we can do this, pastor. Let's go. Let's love well. Woo! I'm all in. I'm not, okay? Just for the record, like, I don't feel like I can do this. And I read this, and I just go, man, how? Maybe I can be patient for a day or two, maybe a week. I, maybe I can be kind. But, but if you get something I really want, I'm probably going to be a little jealous, <laughs> right? If you get something I really want, I'm probably unintentionally going to be a little envious, if, if I get something you want, I'm going to boast about it and tell you. Like, that's, unfortunately, like, we're all in process people, okay? But here's what I've been doing throughout this series is, is my, my mindset, me personally, my mindset has just been, man, I just need to try harder. I'm just going to try harder. I need to try to be more patient. I need to try to be more kind. And I need to try to, to not envy or boast. I need to try to not be self-seeking. I just need to try harder. Isn't that what we do? Right? We show up on a weekend and we, and we sit down and we hear, yeah, yeah, lo love is patient. Like, I, you're right, you're right. Love is patient. I need to be more patient. I totally agree. Man, this service has taken a long time, right? <laughs> or, or, yeah, 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 like, I, I, I get it, right? I, I get it. I know love should be more kind, but have you met my boss? He's a jerk. Like, I'm serious. Have you met him? He's a jerk. Like, that's an open question. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Great human being. Love the guy. But we've convinced ourselves we just need to try harder. But here's the deal. This letter that Paul writes to this group of people, the Corinthians, what he's talking about in this letter, and you've heard this talked about if you've been in the church for any amount of time, he's talking about something that's called agape love. And Grant kind of briefly brushed over it last weekend. But, but just so we're all on the same page, agape love, what Paul is talking about is, is a divine love. It's a love that's unconditional. It's a love that's not so much a feeling or a sediment as it is a willful decision to act in someone else's best interest. Agape love in its nature is relentless. It's illogical. It just loves. It does not need reciprocation. It's agape. And this type of love that Paul's talking about in 1 Corinthians 13 is that type of love. Yet you and I as, as humans, like in our nature, our, our nature is not to love the way Paul's talking about, right? That's not our nature, what we just read up on the screen. You see, our nature is a, is a different kind of, kind of love called phileo love, and that, that in the Greek is like this idea of a love between friends. It's, it's kind of a warm, affectionate, non-romantic, kind of common courtesy love. That's, that's our nature. That's how we naturally love people. And then we come to this reality that, that there's the Corinthians, this group of people that Paul's writing to, and they're not even good at phileo love. They're not even good at common courtesy love. Yeah. Paul's proposing that they love with unconditional agape love. And, and maybe I'm the only one, but I, I look at that and I go, Paul, what are you saying? Like, what are you asking us to do here, Paul? I, I used to be a, a sprinter a, a really long time ago, back in my athletic glory days, right, 15 or 20 years ago. I was a sprinter, and, and I had a lot of fun. It was good. But what this feels like to me is like someone coming to me today saying, hey, I want you to go into the next Olympics, and I want you to beat Usain Bolt. Okay, if you don't know who Usain Bolt is, he is the fastest human being alive today, okay? His last name's Bolt. That's all you really need to know. He's good. He's fast. And what it feels like to me is, is one of you guys going, like, hey, just go into the next Olympics and go beat Usain Bolt. And it's like, uh, okay, no, I'm past my prime. I never could beat the guy. I was never that fast, and I'm white. This just does not add up. Like, I can't do this. And that's how I feel about 1 Corinthians 13. Like, Paul, do you actually think we can do this? Like, do you think that we can love the way you're asking us to love. It's not possible, right? Especially, if you're familiar with the Bible, especially if we consider what Paul himself said in one of his other letters to, to the Romans, and in Romans chapter 7, verse 19, Paul says this, he says, For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. Does that sound familiar? Don't we every year set goals for ourselves? 
This year I'm going to get fit. This year I'm going to get in better shape. This year I'm going to lose weight. This year I'm going to eat better. This year I'm going to open up my Bible and I'm going to read it every day. This year uh, I'm going to read through the entire Bible in a year. Like we set these goals for ourselves. We say, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. And then what happens, right? Uh, this, this is the year. And then a couple of weeks in, we realize that eating better is actually way more expensive than we realized, right? And we realize that working out is work. <laughs> and we realize that, that reading your Bible is difficult to do every day. And we hit these sections that we don't understand and we don't know how to process and we kind of lose our motivation. And then we just kind of decide that mildly, mildly overweight actually is kind of hipster and the belly's coming back, so I'm just going to do that whole thing. <laughs> like, ah, forget the rest of that. Isn't that how it works? And we find ourselves not doing the things we want to do and doing the very thing we don't want to do. And what we're talking about in this series, Without Love, this isn't about you and I trying to love better. That's not what this is about. And so if you've been here for the past few weeks and you've been like, I just need to love better, that's not what this is about. It's not about trying harder. You and I, I would take that a step further, you and I can't try hard enough. That's just the reality. Most things we do in life, though, we can try harder and we can experience, we can experience victory and, and, and we, can, we can see improvements and, and we can, things go well when we try harder in, in most cases in our life, Right? But this isn't goal setting, this isn't self-help, this isn't physical improvement. You don't need Jesus for those things. But what we're talking about today, you need Jesus for. We can't love like we're talking about in this series without Jesus, period. You can't. We're not talking about trying harder, we're talking about transformation. And I hope you leave, if you leave with nothing else today, you leave knowing that we're not talking about trying harder, we are talking about you and I being transformed individuals in Jesus. And as we're transformed into the likeness of Jesus, you and I then can begin to love each other and love God with true, unconditional agape love. And what Paul's doing in 1 Corinthians 13 is Paul's kind of taking you and I to the end of our rope a little bit. He's kind of taking us to this point to where, we, to where we read all these characteristics of what love should be, and we go, man, I can't do this. Like, I can't do it. Like, I, 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 I'm, I'm just not patient enough, and I'm just not, not calm enough, and, and I get angry, and, and at times I'm arrogant, and, and I can't do this. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm just not able, which causes you and I to do what? Hey, God, I can't do this. God, God I, can't, I, I can't do this on my own. I, I don't know how to love like you've asked me to love, God. God, are you there? <laughs> yeah, I'm here. God, what are you, what are you asking me to do? Because I, I feel like you're asking me to love with real unconditional agape love, and I can't do this, God. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Wait, well, what? <laughs> That's weird, because you asked me to do it, but you know I can't do it. What, what's, what's the point, God? What are, you, what are you doing here? Well, I was hoping that, that you'd, you'd try and you'd realize that you can't do this without me. And that's kind of the whole point. Because you need me to love the way I'm asking you to love. You need me to transform your life in order for you to love the way we're talking about. You can't do this on your own. Well, you probably could have just made it a little easier for me, God. You and I, we can't do this on our own. This isn't trying harder. This is transformation. You and I first need to encounter God's unconditional agape love before we can ever go out and try and love the way we're talking about in this series. And so what I would say is if you're someone who's here and you've, you've had the mindset, I just need to try harder. I just need to do this. I need to be more patient. I need to be more kind. What I would say to you today is stop trying. Stop trying because you'll never be able to try hard enough to love the way God's asked us to love. Stop trying and let God's love, let the love of Jesus transform your life. Some of you in this room, you've got to just stop. You've got to start spending time with Jesus. And this week, I, I felt like I really, as I thought and prayed through this, I felt like we couldn't go any farther, any, any further as, as a church. I felt like I couldn't go any further until we really unpacked what this meant in, in, in this context, because we're, we're not talking about trying harder. And I had to remind myself of that. This isn't about you and I trying harder. This is first and foremost you and I spending time at the feet of Jesus. 
you and I being transformed, you and I opening up your Bible, you and I, you and I in prayer, doing these things, because if you're not spending time with Jesus on a regular basis, everything else we're talking about in this series is worthless to you, because it's first and foremost about you and I being transformed into the likeness of Jesus. Without that, this love, being kind and patient and all these things, it's not sustainable. And let me add that just because you spend time with Jesus on a regular basis and you do these things, that, that it doesn't just all of a sudden happen and all of a sudden like, hey, this is easy, I got this. Like, that's not how it works. I wish that was the case, right? It still takes discipline. It still takes time. And so with all of that in mind, I want to go back to 1 Corinthians 13, and I want to unpack this in a little bit more detail. It says this in, in four, 4 through 6. It says, Love is patient and kind. Love is not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. This is where we're going to spend our time. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love is not irritable. Some of your translations will say, Love is not easily angered. That might be more familiar to you. Love is not easily angered. And I think that's true. True love is not easily angered. It's not easily provoked. It's not irritable. True love isn't, it doesn't, doesn't fly off the handle. It's not easily annoyed. It's not thin-skinned. And, and I, I think some of us, we just go, man, I, can we just skip this and move on? Like, let's go past this one, <laughs> right? Love is not easily angered. Like, uh, maybe, I don't know. This is I personally, I, I struggle with this. Like, I would love to skip. If you guys are cool, I'll skip it right now. Like, I, I, I struggle with this. Especially when it comes to my family. I struggle with love is not easily angered. Isn't that, is, it, there's this kind of ironic truth to this is that the, the people that we love the most are the people that we're the least patient with, are the people that we easily anger with, are the people that we don't love well. Those are the people that we say and, and we do love the most, but there's this ironic thing that happens that those are the people that we're not loving well, right? Uh, on Friday night, um, this past Friday, my, my five-year-old son, Cruz, woke up at, at two in the morning and um, I, don't, I don't know why it is with my five-year-old son. When he wakes up anytime, whether it's the normal time to wake up or in the middle of the night, he's the loudest human being on the face of the earth. Like, that's just how he operates. He is like a wild pack of hyenas, whatever that sounds like. That's what I feel like is happening when he wakes up in my house. And so on Friday night at, at two in the morning, he wakes up and he comes into my room and he's like, Dad, I'm hot! <laughs> and I'm like, ah! <laughs> You know, like, okay, <laughs> hey oh, what's happening? <laughs> You know, and he's just like in my face, like yelling. I'm like, okay, buddy, let's go back to bed. And so like I take him back to his room and I kind of get him situated and I put him back in his bed and I'm like, don't, don't put your blankets on, buddy. Like, you'll be fine. You'll cool off. Like, go back to sleep. This will be okay, right? And, and we have a fan in my, my, my boys share a room and they're bunk beds and Cruz is on the top bunk. And, and we have a fan and we, we have the fan in there to kind of drown out noise. Like our house really isn't that hot, but it kind of drowns out the noise. And, and Cruz asked me this. He goes, hey, dad, can you hold the fan on me for a while? <laughs> And he's on the top bunk. It's two in the morning, and I'm just like, no. <laughs> like, no, I'm not going to hold the fan on you for a while. And he's like, Dad, I'm hot. You know, and I'm like, I'm like Shh, your brother's going to wake up. And I'm like, You're, you'll cool off. Just relax. Go to sleep. Close your eyes. And he's like, Dad, Mom holds the fan on me. I'm like, cool. Go get her up. Like, <laughs> she's down the hall, bro. Like, I'm going to go back to bed now, you know, and it's like, J just go to sleep, buddy. And then this was like, this is kind of like when this started to go bad, is then my, my five-year-old son starts taking shots at me in, at two in the morning, and he's like, Dad, will you not hold the fan up because you're not as strong as mom? It's like, what? <laughs> How are you witty at two in the morning? Like, I'm tired, bro. Like, and, and it's like, at this point, I'm just like, go to sleep. Like, I'm out of here, and I went back to my room. Two minutes later, I hear him walking down the hall again, and she's like, Lord, what is this child's problem? And he comes and he's like, Dad, I'm thirsty. I'm like, get out of here. Like, go back to your room. So I take him back to his room again. And, and, I, and I put him up on his top bunk. And, and I get him all situated. I go get him a drink of water. I hand him the water. And then I'm like, okay, we're good. I'm going to go back to bed. And then he's like, Dad, i got to blow my nose. I'm just like, dude, what is with you? Like, what is happening? So I, I get in the tissue, I blow your nose, and it's like at this point where I, I kind of go like angry dad on him a little bit, and, and I'm just like, it's the middle of the night, I'm tired, we're not doing this anymore, go to bed now. You know, you kind of get elevated dad voice a little bit, and then I start to hear him like, start to like almost cry a little bit. He's like, dad, I'm sorry, I'm just having trouble sleeping. Dang it. 
that's like one step above stealing from a two-year-old girl, what I just did. You know, it's like <laughs> my five-year-old son's having trouble sleeping and I'm yelling at him, right? Like, go to bed now. I don't know about you, but, but in my own nature, I'm easily angered. I'm easily irritated, and, and often, too often, I take it out on the ones I love. And I come to this text that says, love is not easily angered. Love is not irritable. And it's like, man, what is the matter with me? Anybody else feel that way? Like, what's the matter with me? If you're married, your husband or your wife, you'll tell them, like, hey, I, I love you so much. But our love isn't really that convincing when, when we lose our temper and, and when we when we yell and when we respond to things they say or do out of irritation or frustration or anger. We tell our children, oh, I love you so much, but our, our love isn't really that convincing when we yell at them when they don't do what we want them to do or act the way we think they should or they wake you up in the middle of the night. This is hard for me. I, I love my two boys so much but those two boys have the ability to get under my skin like no other human beings on the face of the earth. My wife and I, we went, we went um, grocery shopping like a week and a half ago, and it was the first time we've been grocery shopping probably ever without our boys. And it's like, man, this is so peaceful. <laughs> like, who knew grocery shopping could be fun, you know? And some of us, we, we, we think... Ah. I lose my temper a lot, but, it, but it's quick, and it doesn't last long, and it's, it's, it's over with. And it's like, yeah, uh, so is the nuclear bomb, you know? It's like tempers are always destructive, and even a small temper can lead to hurt and damage, especially when it explodes on a regular basis. And my guess is if you're someone who's here and you're easily angered, you're someone who's here and you have a, have a temper, my guess is that, that you lose your temper most often when you're tired when you're worn out, and when you haven't spent time with Jesus, that's when you lose your temper most often. My wife inevitably knows when I haven't spent time in my Bible. My wife inevitably knows every time when I haven't spent time with Jesus because I am more irritable and I am easily angered. And it's in those moments she's like, hey, why don't we just take a break and you go read your Bible for a while? And I'm like, don't tell me what to do, woman. <laughs> you're right, I'm gonna go right now. <laughs> But it's because when you and I spend time with Jesus, when we open up our Bible, when we spend time in prayer, we are being transformed into His likeness. And over time, as you grow, as God changes and develops your heart more and my heart more into what His heart is, we're not as easily angered. We're not as irritable. We're not quick to get to jump all over people and yell and raise our voice. But you and I, we can't do this long-term on our own. The second thing Paul says is this. He says, so he says, love is not easily angered. Then he says, love is not resentful. Some of your translations right here will say, love keeps no record of wrongs. You guys want to skip it? <laughs> right? Love keeps no record of wrongs. If, if, you, if you look back in the Greek of what Paul is saying here, this idea of keeping no record of wrongs, Paul is using this bookkeeping term. And, and it's this, this kind of idea that you would calculate specifically numbers when it comes to uh, figuring entries in a ledger is what Paul's talking about. Like you would write down the figures of what, what people owe you, you would put them in this ledger. That's kind of what Paul is talking about. And the purpose of the ledger is what? To keep record of who owes you what, right? So you always know, you can always consult the book and go back to it and go, okay, that person owes me this, they paid me this much, they still owe me this much. And you can kind of look into it on another level. And, and if you own a business, bookkeeping's a good thing, right? If, if, if in your finances, bookkeeping's a good thing. But when it comes to our personal lives, when it comes to our spiritual lives, it's, it's unnecessary and it's actually very harmful, isn't it? I, I have a specific relationship in, in my life where I've done this. And in this particular relationship, I, I've been disrespected, and I've been taken advantage of, and I've been talked about in, in a negative light. And as that's happened, I've chose to keep a record of wrongs. 
And what happens is some, something will go wrong in this relationship, as it does inevitably every time. Something goes wrong in this relationship, and I'll get irritated, and I'll get upset, and I'll eventually hit this point where I go, I, I know I need to forgive him. I'm going to forgive you. But it seems like unintentionally every time before I forgive him, you know what I do? I write it down the ledger. I write it down. And I tell you that not because I'm proud of that. I'm not. But we do this, don't we? Even if you don't, when you nod your head to make me feel better about myself. We do this, don't we? But what happens is over time as we do this, it will inevitably further damage and destroy that specific relationship. But not only that, it will carry over and spill over into every other relationship we have. When you keep records of wrong in one specific relationship, you will take the anger and the frustration and the irritation and the resentment from that relationship, and you will begin to spill that into your other relationships. And it will begin to affect who? Your loved ones more than anybody else. It says this in Paul's second letter to this, this group of people, the Corinthians. It says this in 2 Corinthians 5, verses 18 and 19. This is Paul again. He says, And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. You see, once sin is placed under the blood of Jesus, once you and I, as Christ followers, come to Jesus and say, God, I, I accept your free gift. Will you please forgive me for what I've done? When we do that, it, it, it says in the book of Acts that it's been wiped away, that it's been blotted out, that it's been clean. It's as if it never happened. You see, true love forgives. True love isn't resentful. It doesn't count and keep a record of wrongs. Love doesn't keep score of other people's shortcomings and sins. Love forgives. Last month, there was a, an absolutely horrible tragedy that happened in Charleston, South Carolina. And if you pay any attention to the national news, what happened was a, a white male walked into an all-black church and he started shooting. And he killed nine people. He killed the lead pastor, he killed a state senator, and he killed seven other people. And the national media expected this church in Charleston, South Carolina, expected this group of people to respond the way most of us instantly think. It's racism. It's bigotry. And they expected this church to just blow it up into this huge thing, make a riot, like out of control. And a pastor from New York came into this church and took it over kind of right after this shooting happened. And here's what the pastor of this church told the national media. He said this, lots of folks expected us to do something strange and break out in a riot well, they just don't seem to know us very well. And as I read this article, I read this article um, earlier this week, and it was like on CNN or MSNBC or one of those, and, and here's what the author of the article said, and this is them speaking. It says, not being a Christian, the author of the article, not being a Christian, I can only marvel at the dignity and courage of the victim's relatives who forgave the shooter. If I could ever manage such a thing, it would probably take me decades, and it took them little more than a couple of days. I'm not sure how I would respond in that type of situation. Someone does something to my loved ones, my first human reaction isn't like, oh yeah, I'm gonna forgive them, I'm gonna love them like Jesus did, I'm gonna love them with real agape love. It's like, no, I'm gonna make them pay, right? Isn't, isn't that our reaction? Isn't that what we do? You see, well, what, I, what I'm saying is this type of love is not possible on our own, yet what we see is time and time again, people are loving and forgiving and demonstrating this type of love all throughout the world. It's not possible, but people are doing it, and it's only through the transformation of Jesus. It only comes from you and I spending time with God. We can't love like that you can't experience tragedy and hurt against a loved one and say, you know what, I forgive you. Matter of fact, not only do I forgive you, but I want to sit down and talk with you, and I want to get to know you. You can't love that way with your own morality. That's not possible. You see, resentment, resentment is, is careful to keep, keep books, to keep a ledger that it reads and rereads, hoping for a chance to get even, hoping for a chance to see the other person pay for the other person to suffer like you've suffered. Remember that time when, when Peter asked Jesus, hey, hey, Jesus, how many times should I forgive my neighbor? Up to seven times? You guys remember that story in the Bible? 
And Peter comes to Jesus like, hey, Jesus, should I, should I forgive my neighbor up to seven times? And Peter thought he was being kind of clever because the, the Jewish law of the time was that you should forgive someone up to three times. And so Peter was like, hey, I'm going to take the three and I'm going to times it by two and I'm going to add one for good measure because I'm a boss. And he's like, Jesus, seven times? Right? Seven. And Jesus is like, uh, no, no, Peter, not seven times. And Peter's like, okay, good, because I, I've already done seven times. Like Peter's expecting Jesus to say, no, 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 three times. And Jesus says, no, no, Peter, not seven times, but 70 times seven times. And Peter's like, whoa, 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 wait, 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 what? <laughs> I don't know if I heard you right, Jesus. Were you choking on your holy water there? Like, I don't know if I got what you said there. Because it sounded like you said 70 times seven. And if I'm asked right, Jesus, that's 490 times. You want me to forgive them 490 times. But what was Jesus doing? Jesus was setting this astronomical figure for Peter to say, don't keep a record, right? 490 times a bookkeeping nightmare, right? Three or six or seven or 10 times, you can keep that record pretty easily. But 490 times, you're not keeping that record that someone else has hurt you or done something against you. So Jesus was setting the number so high to say, don't keep score. Why? Because love keeps no record of wrongs. Why? Because Jesus has completely and permanently forgiven you and I. And if Jesus can completely and permanently forgive you and I for what we've done against him, for the sin that we've lived out, why then can you and I not completely and permanently forgive those who have hurt and sinned and come against us? Third thing Paul says is this. He says, love does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Some of your translations right here will say, love does not delight in evil, but delights in the truth. And, and you and I, we don't have to look very far today, to, it, whether it's magazines, books, TV, movies, we don't have to look very far to, to see um, sin being glorified in our culture, right? We don't have to look very far to see, see people living in the gray area and that kind of being like, oh yeah, just kind of do what you want to do. You be you. Like, the, we live in this culture where people, you set your rights and wrongs. Like, you do what, what feels right to you. Whatever feels good, do it. Like, you be your own person, right? Whatever makes you happy. That's, that's the culture we live in. How many of you, you, you've heard that before, right? But here's the reality. As Christians, you and I, if, if you're here, and I don't want to assume that everybody here has accepted Jesus, but if you're here and you've accepted Jesus, as Christians, you and I are constantly under pressure from culture, we're constantly under pressure from non-Christians, and we're constantly under, pre under pressure from other better Christians to live and be a specific person on the outside, aren't we? We're constantly, people expect us to be a specific, oh, you, you, you've attached your name to Jesus? You have to live this way now. Like, your life should look like this. Isn't that true? You have to be a specific person on the outside. Like, you can't, you have to always be patient now. It's like, whoa, 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 I'm in a hurry. Like, <laughs> I'm in a hurry. I'm not always patient, you know? Or you, you always have to be kind now. It's like, well, well they were kind of did something that was hurtful to me. Like, but you have to be this way now because you, you've attached your name to Jesus and you're a Christian. In his book, uh, Enemies of the Heart, Andy Stanley says it this way, and he, said, he says, we're talking about Christians. He says, we're constantly under pressure to be one thing on the outside, but if we're not careful, our outside behavior, our outside persona will outpace our heart. You and I, we're very good at monitoring our behavior, aren't we? That's, that's, that's pretty easy to monitor. But we're not very good at monitoring our heart, are we? And something I think each one of us needs to ask this morning, kind of as we process the, even through this series, something we need to ask is, is your behavior, is your attempt to love people better, love people well, outpacing your heart? Is what's going on on the outside of your life, the person you're trying to be, the persona you're trying to magnify out to people, is that person, that your outside life, is it outpacing your heart? Because if, if your outside life is outpacing your inside life, there will come a day when your inside life catches up with your outside life, and for some of you, that might be the worst day of your life. But that day could be avoided if you and I would stop trying to love better, if you and I would stop trying to love more, if you and I would stop trying harder and just allow Jesus to transform us from the inside out. I, I, I want to look at an account, and we're going to kind of finish with this this morning. I, I want to look at an account in, in Matthew chapter 15, and this is where Jesus, you, many of you are familiar with this story, but Jesus is talking to kind of some religious leaders and figures of the time, 
and, and it's going to be up on the screen behind me. I'm going to kind of jump around through it a little bit, um, but we'll be in Matthew chapter 15, starting in verse 1. It says this. It says, Then the Pharisees and the scribes, these are the religious leaders, came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat. He answered them, And why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? So Jesus says this to these religious leaders. Then he kind of there's a discussion that happens amongst them. And then I want to pick up in verse 7. It says this. He says, this is Jesus speaking. He says, you hypocrites. And then he quotes the book of Isaiah, the Old Testament book. He says, well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me. In other words, what Jesus is saying there is, look, you're a bunch of people who your behavior looks great. You're a bunch of people who what you're saying with your mouth, the things you're projecting, that's all good, but your heart is not good. I don't want to be that type of person. I don't want to be the type of person who plays Christian Right? And my guess is you don't want to be that person either. You don't want to be the try harder behavioral Christian. I don't want that for you. I don't want that for me. I want us to be the type of people, I want us to be the type of church that doesn't care how people see us, that doesn't care what people say we should or shouldn't do, what people say we should or shouldn't, how people say we should or shouldn't act, how people say we should or shouldn't love, because I want us to be the type of people who look to Jesus, who sit at the feet of our Savior and are transformed, and out of our transformation, we are then able to go out and love each other with real, unconditional agape love. We are able to love God the way he planned, not because anybody told us to, not because anybody expected it, but because because Jesus, that's what I want for us. And I know that's what you want for you. You don't come here every weekend so you can play church. It, it says this in 1 John chapter 4, verse 11 and 12. It says, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. What's, what's John saying there? What he's, what, he's, what he's doing and what he's saying is, is Jesus is in heaven at the right hand of God. And who does that leave? You and I, right? That leaves you and I. That leaves Christians, Christ followers, to then go out and love well. That means that you and I become dispensers of the love of Jesus in our city, in our community, in our work, in our families, that we are dispensing the love of God. And John says that no one has ever seen God, but, but it's a little tongue-in-cheek because what he's saying is they will see God, and they will see God not because of your moral discipline, not because of your information, not because of your knowledge, not because of your possessions, not because of your behavior, not because of your ethics, not because of your money. They will see God not because of any of those things, but because you have been transformed by your Savior. And they will see Jesus because you have rejoiced in the truth. You have rejoiced with the good news. You have rejoiced in the gospel, which is Jesus Christ, and that your life has been transformed. And people will look at our lives, and they will think we're a bunch of weirdos. But they will look at us, and they will go, there's something different about that weirdo. And they'll see that our love's illogical, that our love's countercultural, that our love is a bit naive, but they will see people who have rejoiced in the truth, and they will see people that have been set free because of what Jesus has done. Amen? Will you pray with me? Jesus, I'm so grateful for you. I'm so grateful that, that you first loved me, that you first loved us enough to endure the cross so that we could experience life, so that we could experience eternal life, so that we could experience forgiveness. And Jesus, I pray for myself and I pray for my friends here today that we would never be people who look at, at, at 1 Corinthians 13 and, and convince ourselves and tell ourselves that we just need to try harder, that we look at it and go, man, I can do this on my own. I just need to try. I need, I need to will it. I need, I need to do these things. But we would look at this and go, man, I can't do this, but I know you can, Jesus. And that we would be people that sit at your feet and experience your love
your unconditional forgiveness and out of that, that we would be able to love better, that we would be able to love more. And Jesus, I pray that the glory would always point back to you, that it would always point to who you are and what you've done. And God, when, when we blow it, because we will, help us to not get discouraged, but to stay focused and know that, Lord, you can continue to grow and transform us into your likeness. Jesus, we want to be people who love well. We want to be people who, who don't have it all figured out, but are in process towards loving with unconditional agape love. And God, through that, that our lives, our communities, our work, our relationships would be transformed. God, we love you. We're grateful for you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you.